look with me in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 6. In our study through this book, really of the priest Ezra, and yet at the same time a prophet of the Lord, because he would take the law once everything was re established in the land and teach it under the people. Not for the law's sake, but for what it represented. There was a reason that God was bringing the remnant back into Israel, reestablishing, rebuilding this temple, Zerubbabel's, which would exist all the way up until Christ Himself came and entered into that temple. That's when the glory of God entered in, when Christ entered in. But I wanted to consider with you in this study here in Ezra 6, in verses 13 down to verse 22, God prospering his work. We know that whatever God has determined, he will accomplish. Have that scripture out on our sign that I put up there this week that says that my word shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish all that I am pleased to do with that word. You can understand that word word in two ways. Because first of all, Christ the Word. God sent forth would not return unto the Father void. A lot of people preach about the so-called Jesus that came down here and lived a good life and laid down his life. But alas, there are a lot of people for whom he came that will end up in hell anyway. That's not the God of Scripture. When he says, my word Again, was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He's talking about His Son accomplishing what He sent Him to do. Christ Himself said that of all the Father gave, He did not, He lose nothing. But also, God's Word, even what we're reading right now, this revealed, inspired Word that we have here, it will not return unto Him for it. I know there's some who say, well, yeah, but look at all the preaching going on and still people don't believe as if somehow God had failed. He had that same word that he sent forth will accomplish his purpose and will either for salvation on everyone that he has cho chosen or for condemnation, those that he has declared to be vessels of wrath. Either the way, we know that God will prosper his work. So it begs the question, well, how do we know where, when, and how God is truly blessed? How do we know what's a blessing? How do we know, even as we read a little while ago there in Jeremiah, what's deception? Because the Lord blinds many. Yet, but even in that, God is prospering his work. But as far as blessing his work for Christ's sake in the sense of salvation, we have here in this scripture, verses 13 to 22 of Ezra 6, a work that God purposed should be accomplished and it was done. So let's read this, first of all, verses 13 to 15. Then Tatnai, governor on this side the river, Shethar, Boznai, and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speak. Remember, they had asked, written a letter to Darius the great, and asked him whether it was proper that these Jews should be proceeding with the building of this temple. And they got their answer. Darius did some searching in the archives and found that yes, Cyrus had declared decreed, see Cyrus was God's servant, decreed that that temple should be rebuilt and so he gave the order that it should be built without 
impeding them in any way. In fact, you, you see that in verse 12, it's all that time, the God that had caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand an altar and to destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made it decree. Let it be done with speed. So if you were to ask me, how do we know God is prospering his work? It's when God is pleased to move men, whether they're his or not, all creatures are his, but to accomplish the work that he's purposed to do, and none can hinder, none can stay in his hand or say to him, what doest thou? And so, in verse 14, the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet of Zechariah, the son of Iddo, and they built it and finished it. That's what we saw last time. What God purposes to do, he finishes. There's an accomplishing of it. We know that to be so even in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not open-ended. It's not that he came and lived a perfect life and then laid down his life and now he's up in heaven and somehow hoping, wishing, praying somehow that things will work out. No. Just like this temple which they built it, it says they finished it. Well, that's how we know too that this is God's work. What he's purposed, he accomplishes. And what God purposed from eternity, that there would be that people that he gave his son for whom Christ would come and accomplish their salvation, whether for redemption, whether for sanctification, whether for justification. When were these sinners justified that God purposed to save? When Christ finished the work, when he cried with a loud voice, it is finished. What part of that don't you understand? It's not when you see it that it's been, no. It was finished even before we ever had eyes to see. But I'll tell you this, if the Lord ever gives you eyes to see by his spirit, you'll see it was finished there at Calvary. That's that work, just like this temple. The foundation was laid, there's no other foundation that can be laid in that which is laid in Christ himself and the work finished. And notice, it's not according to the commandment of men, even though we read there that the Lord caused Darius to make the decree, but who gets the glory? Here it says in verse 14, according to the commandment of the God of Israel, the God, Love that definite article of Israel. Who's God's Israel? That word means prince with God. And it's a title. Yes, Jacob was called Israel because it represents what God purposed to make of his seed in Christ, the Israel of God. But Christ himself is the Israel of God. He's the prince of God. So it's according to the commandment of Christ's God, be another way to read that, and or even according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius. And this house, it says in verse 15, was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So here again, where God purposes to accomplish a work, it is accomplished and done so with diligence. Here these diligently, when it says there, so they did speedily. They diligently did according to what King Darius had declared. And they were diligent in not only finishing the work and rebuilding the temple, but diligent in, as Darius said, opposing or punishing anybody that opposed them. 
And I find it prophetic there, even in verse 12, when this decree was given, this was God declaring his decree when he said, and the God that hath caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. You can fast forward because this is the same temple that when Christ came, all of the Jews were busy about their making this house of den of thieves. They were in essence destroying the very foundation for which that temple had been rebuilt and that is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Lord said your house will be left to you desolate. So even here I see a prophetic pronunciation against those that would even deface or defame the true purpose for that temple being built, which was Christ, it didn't have anything to do with making the Jews happy. It had everything to do with Christ. But that's how we know that God prospers his work. He completes what he has purposed. But also I want you to note here, before we move on in verse 14, that where God is pleased to prosper a work, he raises up faithful servants in order to direct and encourage the people, his people, in that work of exalting Christ. There's a reason it says there in verse 14, and the elders of the Jews build it, but what? There's the word, they prospered See, this is God prospering his work. They prospered how? Through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edom. So at this point, we'd have to go over, given the time, and read the entire prophecy of Haggai during this time, and Zechariah, to see how it was that the Lord had raised these up at this time, I know we're in Ezra, but in Haggai and our Bibles, we find way later in the order in which it's put here. That's because the Septuagint <clears throat> divided these Old Testament scriptures up into three parts. It had the history books. Well, first it had the law of Moses. And then it had what would be considered the history books that we've been through and studied and Kings and Chronicles, etc. But then the third part was the prophets, and they put those toward the end. But all of these are united in one purpose to declare God's glory in the accomplishing of this work with regard to the temple. Why? Because it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we've already seen work on this temple had made little progress because of the opposition and the preoccupation for a while of the returnees with their own houses. Look over in Haggai with me. Just keep going toward Matthew and eventually you'll get to Haggai just before Zechariah. Those two books are together in our Bibles and they were both contemporary. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. But you can see in Haggai chapter 1, in verses 2 and 3, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, it, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your ceiling houses, and this house lie waste? The Lord had brought them back. There was a lethargy with regard to this temple being rebuilt until the Lord stirred them up. Well, how did He stir them up? Well, we're reading this here through these prophets. Verse 5 Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. These are the words of Haggai. You've sown much, bring in little. You eat, 
but you have not enough, you drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none more. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. In other words, you're laboring for yourself, but God's not going to bless that. And then verses 10 and 11, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. This is God's providence. Even though they were laboring, not giving consideration to the rebuilding of that temple. And so the Lord has ways of getting attention, the attention of his people. He just shut up the heavens and the earth. And I called for a drought upon the land. This is the Lord speaking, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. And that's when, verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. You see, when the Lord raises up, his servants to declare his glory and point sinners to Christ. Those that are his do hear. That's what that word obey means. They began to hear who? The voice of the Lord their God. How? Through the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, the Lord's message unto the people. Now, see what? Just using psychology to get to be. He was preaching the Lord's message unto the people. I am with you, said the Lord. Those words sound very similar to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fear not, I am with you. What was Haggai doing but pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ? So, Again, through these servants, prophets that he raised up. That's, that's how you know God's prospering the work. There aren't many today around the world, but where you find one of the Lord's servants standing in an evil generation and pointing sinners to Christ, I've often said God never sends his servants on fool's errands just to go out there and battle. But where he raises up these servants to declare his glory and justice and holiness and sovereignty and his work of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, know that the Lord is about his work. And he does indeed prosper that work. Not to the salvation of anybody and everybody, but to the salvation of that elect, that remnant. Just like it says there in verse 12, Haggai 1. He raised up Zerubbabel, type of Christ, Joshua, the priest, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. It wasn't even all the people. It was the remnant. And they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. How was it that Lydia's heart was open? It was the Lord that opened her heart. How did the Philippian jailer believe it was the Lord that raised him up? We'll come back here now to my text, verses 16 to 18, where God is prospering his work. Not only does he purpose it and accomplish it, secondly, he raises up faithful prophets, preachers, to declare his glory to the people, and thereby they do follow the third where God is pleased to prosper his work, there is a rejoice among the people in the true and exclusive work of God, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this temple is about, verse 16. And the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. Underscore that with joy. It says up there that the temple was finished, verse 15, the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year 
Every time I see third day, I think of Christ being raised the third day. The work was finished. That means that it actually, from the time the construction resumed to the finishing, was another four years. But all told, it would have been about 20 years if we keep track of the chronology. But the Lord, when He purposed that it be finished, made quick work of it. And as a result, the people, it says there, the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites can never see God's work prospering other than through what's represented here as the priests and the Levites. They were the mediators. That's how God was blessed. And they kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. That word dedication literally means to be completely given to all that it represented. And uh, there was truly a joyous reception of how was it received? It says in verse 17, they offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bullets, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel, 12 he goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. I love that, according to the number of the tribes. This is representative of Christ's sacrifice that had a specific number. All those that the Father had given. But there cannot be any true rejoicing except it be through sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. All of this is picturing the work that the Lord Jesus Christ would accomplish. But notice it took hundreds and thousands of sacrifices to represent the one sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, this was how God was pleased to prosper his work in giving this people a rejoicing and offering these sacrifices as a representation of Christ because of their sin. The Old Testament was called an atonement because it covered the sin. Blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, but you don't find that word used in Christ in the New Testament. The New Testament is reconciliation, it's propitiation, it's redemption. Christ didn't just cover. I've heard people say that, you know, I'm thankful that Christ's blood covers my sin. Uh, if that's all it is, then he never, he never did anything. It's more than the blood of bulls and goats. You know, our sins, if Christ paid our sin debt, weren't merely covered. It's not an atonement but it's a fulfillment. It is a putting away of that sin once for all. And so that's what we see described here. This is how God prospers a work. It's through the work of his son. Not any righteousness in them, but in the forgiveness of sins and justification that this foretold in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says they said, the priests in verse 18 in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God which is at Jerusalem. Notice, as it is written in the book of Moses. All of these things had to be done and accomplished according to the law until Christ should come and fulfill them in his person, in his work. And then all of this was done away. And so in verses 19 through 22. When it says they assigned the priests to their divisions. In other words, there was an order whereby these priests would go in and out according to the law of Moses. God's a God of order. And so each one at their point in time going in and out to fulfill all that God required. But in verses 19 through 22, the end of the chapter. This is the crescendo. What I call the crescendo of everything we're studying here. Just like with the children of Israel, a lot was going on with those plagues. But I'll tell you, when did the deliverance come? When that Passover lamb was slain. Christ our Passover. And that's what we see here in verse 19. The children of the captivity kept 
the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month for the priests and the Levites to purify together and all of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of captivity and for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. When you get over the New Testament, priests and Levites represent Christ's church. He made of his church a kingdom of priests unto God. Christ is the high priest, and these priests and Levites represent, but they had to be pure by the same sacrifice before they could offer these sacrifices. And so it is with us. Before we can offer any praise and glory unto God, we have to be declared pure, righteous, holy before God. How so? Through the one sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Passover lamb. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Christ our Passover is slain. And the children of Israel, which would come again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat. That's the purpose of the Passover lamb being slain. That's to partake. That's what we do in partaking of Christ. His blood shed. His body is our meat. His blood shed is our drink. And they kept the feast of unleavened Bread seven days with joy. The Lord, notice that? How do you know the Lord's prospering or work? The Lord had made them joyful. How do you know where God is prospering or work? There are a lot of different congregations going through all kinds of ceremonies and fanfare, but if you want to know where God is prospering his work, it's where you find the people, a remnant that worship God in spirit and truth and rejoice in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ as their only hope. Here it says, for the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. He even Caused the pagan kings, and says there turned the, the heart of the king of Assyria unto them and strengthened them. He caused even some of these to contribute to the work to make sure that it was accomplished as it should be. This was a title, the king of Assyria, but really it would refer to Darius again and uh, represents how the Lord directed even him to contribute, to stir up the people, even as he stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, his predecessor, to strengthen the hands of the people to accomplish the work of God. Well, I'm thankful there's a remnant today, like Paul wrote about there in Romans 11, according to the election of grace, this in this present time. How do you know where God's prospering his work? Well, it's in the foundation that's been laid in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that temple where that foundation was laid. It's a spiritual temple. It's not temples made with hands, but in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, where you see God prospering that work, you see people gathered and rejoicing. 